Thank you all for coming. I would love it if you. Hi, my name. Can you hear me? Thank you. My name is Betsy Sweet, and. Um, I'm glad my name is Clapworthy. <laughs> and I just want to say, first of all, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for coming here and giving voice to what I believe is the real name. The love and the kindness and the compassion. And I want to tell you how I got here and then invited all of you, 350 of my closest friends. <laughs> I was lit 500, sorry, 500. Um, so I have wear many hats like all of you. I am a mother of children, two of whom are of color. I am, I've been a state house activist in this state for 35 years. I have done bullying prevention training across this state in many, many schools across the state. And I am a therapist and coach and healer. And every single one of those hats, every single one of those buttons was pushed by the events of the last week and a half. And every time I heard him speak, I didn't get mad. I didn't get rageful. I got very sad. Yeah. I felt compassion, but I was very sad, not just for him, but for all the people in Maine whose lives were touched. Not just Drew Gatine, not just the individuals, but the way that kind of language and behavior works is that everybody who is anything like it or any touch, whose lives are touched by any of those issues, feels scared, feels hurt, feels sad. And I have worked with hundreds of children in this state who have been the victims of horrific bullying. And to a child, what they tell me is that it's not, the, the most hurtful thing is not the bully, it's not even the event. What hurts the most is all the people who see it and do nothing. On Sunday afternoon, sitting at my kitchen table with a dear friend of mine, the silence was deafening. People were not, people were afraid to speak out. People had become complacent. Oh, we've heard this before. Oh, this is just him shouting off, spouting off again. But this was different. And this was a culmination of many things. And so I said, well, the other thing I was aware is that, as I said, a lot of us, I think all the citizens of Maine are both the bullied and the bystanders. And we are all hurting. We are hurting that our state is represented like this. We are hurting that people talk like this. and think that somehow those words, those attitudes represent the beautiful people who live in this beautiful state. And I and you and we all said, stop, enough, no more. So save our state, S to save our state. S is for stop the violent threats, stop the bullying, Stop the racism. Stop the homophobia. Yes. O is to offer support to the real issue of drug addiction in this state, which is, we agree, is a horrible issue. This year, last year, 272 people in Maine died of overdoses. This year, halfway through the year, 180 people have already died. We are on track to double the number from last year. Yes, we have an incredible problem. We need creative, compassionate, loving, solidarity voices to address this problem. And division and hatred and name calling and pointing fingers and 
and pretend guns does, does nothing to stop this problem. If anything, it means that there are 500 people here worrying about this instead of on the streets offering a handout and a hand up to people in need who really need our help. We will not be distracted. And the final, the final F is step aside. Now, just before you all start, there are people here who want him to be impeached. There are people here who want him to be resigned. There, it's okay. We are going to be civil. We are civil human beings. We cannot, we cannot meet hate with hate. We cannot meet horrible language with horrible language. The only thing we can do is to say, this is not a sign of a healthy person. Someone who speaks like this. Regardless, it's okay to have different opinions. But someone who cannot be civil, someone who cannot be kind, someone who cannot be compassionate, right. something is wrong. So we are asking him to at least step aside until he can get the help he needs or whatever it is that he needs in order to become a governor of all of us. Because right now, sadly, he is not fit to govern. He doesn't represent you, he doesn't represent me, he doesn't represent the millions of people in Maine. So save our state. That is what we are asking. We are asking people all over the state to come together, to be kind to one another, to offer support, to offer that help. We have a couple, this is going to be, we want this to be short. We're not going to keep you here a long time. The most important thing is that we come together and share our energy and share our hearts for the wonderful positive things about Maine and to say, not in my name. So we have a couple of speakers and we're going to start off with Leslie Manning from Bath, who is an ordinary citizen, this is like all of us, um, who has a few words to share with us. Thank you, Leslie. Love Cynthia. one another. Treat others as you would yourself be treated. I'm a member of the Religious Society of Friends, the Quakers, a faith tradition that speaks truth to power with love. In that spirit, I want to remind all of us of a creation story in which the divine scoops up earth, the dirt of this earth, spits into it, molds it, and breathes life into being. In that moment, and forever after, there is no them. There is only us. We are one. When we forget that, and we do, we are sent messengers to remind us, for that is what prophet means, messenger. They say, woe to you who make bad laws, who benefit the wealthy at the expense of the widow and the orphan. And to the people they say, wake up. This is not what has been planned for you. We do not want you to suffer oppression and have no reason to hope. There are none so blind as those that will not see, nor so deaf as those who will not hear. Listen and change your lives. So we gather tonight knowing that the, the way things are are not the way life should be. And those messengers still have words for us. Love one another. Love God. Love your neighbor. Love yourself in that order. And what does love require of us? 
to move from that spirit of love out into the world, reminded that we are judged by how we treat the most vulnerable among us, how we clothe the naked, feed the hungry, cure the illness, comfort the afflicted, the addicted, the mentally ill, the physically abused, and their abusers, the left behind, the bullied, and yes, their bulliers. We stand here tonight and say, like Dorothy Day, I love God only as much as I love the person that I like the least. Because this is not only about how Paul LePage treats us, this is about how we treat Paul LePage. Paul, you are our brother and you need help. Get it. Paul, you are a child of God who needs love and forgiveness. Ask for it. Paul, as our governor, you have irretrievably broken the compact between us. You must leave now. Your actions and your words are unacceptable and in any other setting, workplace or classroom, you would be held accountable. Since you seem unable to do this for yourself, we ask our elected representatives to do it on our behalf for our state, for our beloved community, and for our children. And for you, Paul, we ask this for you. I wish you could all see yourself. <laughs> You're beautiful. Uh, so, but I would like you. I'm going to introduce our next um, speaker. But I would love you to just turn right now to look to your neighbor and just smile. Recognize the light in them. Recognize the humanity in them. <laughs> recognize the difference. Recognize the difference and recognize the same energy that we all share. And as you do that, let me invite up to the, to the microphone Dr. Reverend Bill Barter, who's a pastor in Lewiston. I feel like there's like a mosh pit in front of me. I, I, I'm not, I, I don't know what else to say about this. All right, so be ready, just in case. Uh, my name is Dr. Uh, Bill Barter, and I'm a Lutheran pastor of the New England Synod. And just to confuse you a little bit, um, I'm also um, serving as an Episcopal priest in Lewiston at the current time. We share, <laughs> we share clergy, we Lutherans and Episcopalians. I'm a Lutherpalian. Now. Yeah. I'm an Episcopalian, yeah. I sit on the board of the Maine Council of Churches and the Religious Coalition Against Discrimination. And in another life, I'm licensed as a doctoral psychologist in Maine. And so in addition to teaching forensic psychology at the university, I practice forensic psychology, mainly specializing in child protection, family matters, and criminal law. Tonight, I speak mainly as a Maine citizen. A native Mainer of over 60 years, I know I don't look it. Um, I was born in Bath, spent much of my childhood in Portland, and now live in Brunswick. As a pastor, I've served churches from Portland to Wallagrass, which is a suburb of Fort Kent, for those of you who don't know where that is. I know Maine very well. I've driven its roads a lot. And I love this state. 
and these days my heart is breaking. I have never in my lifetime seen the level of dysfunction that we have witnessed coming from the Blaine House since 2011. Never. I've seen times in history when the Maine governor and the legislature were at odds. Governor Longley comes to mind and a few others. But, you know, even then, I have never seen state government so paralyzed or so polarized. As a pastor, I have to refrain from calling for resignation or removal of the governor. The people at Trinity in Lewiston cherished their tax-exempt status. <laughs> As a psychologist, <laughs> I must be careful not to diagnose a person whom I've never evaluated in person. I cherish my license. I do, however, have a few reflections for your consideration. First and foremost, I want to live up, lift up those who are most hurt by a broken government and by a man who simply does not seem up to the task of governing. And of course I'm speaking of the poorest, most vulnerable members of our society. The people who depend most on a well-functioning and compassionate government. They never benefit from a sideshow. And they are deeply hurt when they are vilified and blamed for the state's problems. I'm speaking of people addicted to drugs and affected by drugs, people whose lives have been sacrificed on the altar of addiction and of their families. They never benefit from racially charged rhetoric disguised as empty, empty and heartless bravado that cannot save one person from addiction. I'm speaking of the state's children who live in New England's most food insecure state, who depend on state government to protect them, to ensure that they are in good health, to make sure that they are well educated, to help them grow up to be good and responsible citizens, and to guarantee their rights regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity or what bathroom they want to use. Our kids never benefit from the obscene words and abusive actions of anyone, least of whom the man who should be a role model and their number one guardian. These functions of government are a no-brainer, but right now they look like non-starters. And reasonable people are asking why we have an executive who cannot or will not make sure these things happen. So something has to change. Governor LePage has been a champion for the movement against domestic violence and other forms of partner abuse. In my career, in, this, in all fairness to him, I have rarely seen a governor more committed to being hands-on in cases of domestic violence where children have been harmed. I've seen that side of him at our clinic. In fairness, I have to give him that. And perhaps I think that may be one of the ways in which he works out his own childhood pain. But the proverbial elephant in the living room is the cyclical nature of abuse. This is when the abuser engages in a pattern of abuse and apology, abuse and apology, while the root belief systems and behaviors do not change. Ironically, ironically, this is the relationship that we Mainers are experiencing with our governor right now. An axiom of psychology, and I say this on the stand in court at least once a week, is that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. I can tell you that in my experience, this rings true almost all of the time, especially when the bad behavior is not followed by meaningful treatment and change. In the cycle of abuse, the apologies of today become the worsening abuse of tomorrow. And in the immediate time, 
the most secure way of ending the cycle of abuse is to leave it behind. There are many sensible people in Maine of all parties now asking the question, should we break up with our abuser? Will his apologies ever be enough? No. You guys are really responsive. Could we get a couple of collection baskets going? On? And and importantly, and importantly, I want you to hear this. And how can he? How can Paul LePage get better or get healthy in a system where he's allowed to continue a well-established pattern of abuse? These are reasonable questions based on all we know about abusive patterns. We are in the midst of an unraveling of the fabric of Maine society that really concerns me. I'm also concerned about the loss of our good nature around the world. Our good name, I'm sorry, around the world. And the only way to stop it is to examine what's happening at the top. As a person of faith, I pray for lots of people every day and the governor is no exception. While in the midst of dismay and disappointment, I never forget to hold him and all of our elected leaders in prayer. My faith tells me that Paul LePage is a child of God made in the image and likeness of God. He is wounded, and if we do not temper our indignation with compassion, then we too have become abusers. Yeah. In our public discourse, we must be careful about name-calling and irresponsible generalities. We must remain focused on what is best for Maine. A solution is needed now. The answer may well be the dissolution of the fractured relationship between our governor and our people. All things considered, it would appear to people with clear minds and cool heads that nothing else has worked or will work. I pray, and I ask you to pray, that the right decisions are made, and that in all we decide, in all that the governor decides, the good of the entire state is considered. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce Decca Delac, who's a member of the Somali Community Senator of Maine, for a few remarks. Decca? And Stecca is not going to get up on the table, so you're going to hear her even if you can't see her. She's very beautiful. <laughs> Good, evening. Good evening. Thank you everyone for coming here tonight. My name is Decca Delac. I am a black woman an immigrant, and a Muslim. All of these identities that make up the person that's been standing in front of you has been viciously and inexcusably attacked by our governor. Paula Beach promotes nothing but hatefulness and bigotry. The enemy right now is people of color and people of Hispanic descent. Those were the words of our governor. Anti-blackness and colorism is embedded in virtually everything that has to do with society regardless. However, these words are promoting and tolerating this racial divide and makes them okay, makes them expected. It become normal these days. We live in the widest state in the country where our population is at least 96% white. Black people and people of color in this state do not have the wiggle room for such slander or hate. I have three kids. Thank you. I have three kids, two sons 
and a daughter. I fear for their lives every single day and their well-being. And I talk to them regularly, like any other black or color families in this country. And for all our governor to openly say that we are the enemy makes it that much more likely that they could be attacked in whatever manner. The governor is a political figure, one in a power and authority position. This shows that his words have substance and meaning. This resonates with people, especially those who voted to keep him in office, not once, but twice. Two terms. There are residents in Maine that do not come into contact of the, often with people of color. And when they hear these words, it automatically generates false perception of us. And yes, that's false. Thank you. LeBage claims he is in possession of a binder that has full of black people in it. <laughs> he said they are criminals. <laughs> and that is 90% of that it shows if they are black people and people of Hispanic descent that we stated earlier. This message automatically associates drug with people of color than actually get to the root of the drug epidemic main suffers from. This is not the first time we have heard and seen the true colors of our governor. How many more times at the expense of people of color must we go through this to realize this wrongdoing? Thank you. Maine, the way, the way life should be. Now, the way life could be if we learn how not to channel our ignorance towards the people who are not the enemy. Paul LeBage, Mr. Governor, we are mothers, we are fathers, we are children to make a living and thrive in a place where we are not accepted. Thank you. And our next speaker, um, well, before I introduce our next speaker, who is not a stranger to most of you, um, I just want to, this crowd just keeps growing, it's extraordinary. Um, yay. <laughs> um, yeah. um, and I just want to say that when Rachel is finished, we're going to do uh, a little, a little sing, just a little bit of singing as we, we're going to do something pretty extraordinary. Uh, pizza, yeah, free pizza. <laughs> um, the original plan, when I thought there would be 50 to 100 of us, was going to go make a circle around the Blaine House, a circle of compassion and kindness. So the, I've talked to the police. <laughs> they are my friends. And um, that is going to be logistically difficult. But when, when Rachel is done, we are going to sing. And as we sing, see how big this park is? We are going to all stand in a circle and hold hands. You can put your signs down, and then we are going to do um, some energetic action because I can't help myself, <laughs> which will be explained later. But before we do that, let me introduce um, Rachel Talbot Roth, uh, who has been an activist and an extraordinary member of the state for many, many years, just like her dad, who is sitting right here. Jerry was one of the first. And Rachel is way more than Jerry's daughter, um, but I do want to say as someone who came to work at the state 35 years ago, when I asked who were the people of integrity, and who were the people of truth, and who were the people of power, um, Jerry's name, Jerry Talbot Ross's name was always, Jerry Talbot's name was always the first one people said. So thank you for being with us, Jerry, and welcome, Rachel.
Maya Angel. You may not control all the events that happen to you, but you can decide not to be reduced by them. Yeah. Yeah. Governor, we will not be reduced or defined by the events you've made happen this week, last week, the last six and a half years. Governor, we will not be reduced or defined by your ignorance. I am a proud ninth generation Mainer of African American descent. I have heard throughout my entire life that there is no racism in Maine, said as an indisputable fact, because there's not enough of you here. <laughs> like there needs to be a critical mass or a particular number for racism to be present. I'm going to frame my remarks, my brief remarks, by offering a few definitions because, Governor, words matter. And I think that there's a few words that you may need a better understanding about. Race is not biological. It was socially constructed. In 1950, the United Nations issued a summary of findings that all human beings belong to the same species and that race is not a biological reality, but a myth. Racism, therefore, is a belief in this myth that combines prejudice with power, that positions one race superior to all others and leads to different consequences for different groups generation after generation. It lives at many levels. It's individual, it's institutional, it is structural, and its impact is experienced by all of us each and every day. In these definitions, Governor, you do not find a threshold number that justifies if racism is present or not. Make no mistake, Racism is alive and well in Maine, and as our leader, there are some numbers you do need to know. According to the American Community Survey from 2010 to 2014 in the greater Portland metropolitan area, white poverty rate was 10.3% compared to the figure for black, 46.5%. This is in the area of this state that is considered the economic and cultural and educational center. 12% of whites aged 18 to 64 don't have health insurance. The figure for blacks is 20%. White unemployment rates were 6.5 compared to black at 19.5 in the greater Portland metropolitan area. The median earnings for whites was $32,000, for blacks $16,700. 6% of whites do not have a high school degree compared to 23% black. There's one more definition that I'd like uh, for the governor to hear. Albert Einstein said that the definition of insanity is to repeat the same thing over and over again looking for a different outcome. The message here tonight is Governor, please get some help. Please get some help. We must not do business as usual. These do not reflect Maine's values. This is not who we are. We can do better. Our response to racism, though, has been insanity. Yes. We must have the courage to not simply replace one actor with another without taking the necessary actions of addressing the conditions and the outcomes that we have produced by allowing racism to be our political institution. Governor, please get some help.
Trump will change it. Oh. People of the state of Maine, you may not control all the events that happen to you, but you can decide not to be reduced to them. Please, stand up, shout, stand up, take a look at what's happening in our state. Yes, we're in pain. I mean, we're all in pain. We need the governor to get help. We need the governor to step aside. But more importantly, as Mainers, we need to address racism here in the state of Maine. Don't wait until a next generation is falling behind. Do not wait for the next generation to fall behind. Take action now to address the racism in the state of Maine. Goodbye, Paul. Um, but I think it will be very, I think it will be very powerful. So there is a tribe in Africa and of which I do not know the name, I'm sorry. <laughs> but when someone yes, when someone when someone commits an atrocity or someone commits a violent act or someone commits something really wrong, the entire community circles them literally in a circle and puts them in a cent in the center and says and says all the wonderful things about them because the only reason that they could possibly have committed such horrible language and atrocities is that they must have forgotten who they are. It is to remind them and to remind this state and to remind this country and the BBC and the world who is reporting on this story, we are now, this is our opportunity to remind ourselves, our neighbors, our friends, our enemies, to remind everyone who we are. So I am going to ask you, as we sing, this little light of mine, <laughs> right? I would like us to be, and don't leave, this is really important, and, um, and MSNBC is going live with us at 7.25, so don't leave. <laughs> we don't care about that. But I, would, <laughs> um, what I would like you to do is put your signs down, and as we sing, I would like us to create a circle of caring, a circle of truth, a circle of compassion, for everyone in Maine who is hurting, for all those people who are struggling with drug addiction, for all those people who are struggling with the insults and the racism and the homophobia and the hurts of this governor, we are going to create a circle of healing. So please, as we sing, and we're going to have two lovely people help us sing, um, we're all going to sing this little light of mine, and we're going to just get in a circle and hold hands with our neighbors. And then we are going to read um, a poem and take some action. Okay, so if you will do this, this this should be um, this will be great. You'll be perfect. All right. So here we go. Ready? And I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. This song will remain. I'm gonna let it shine all over me. I'm gonna let it shine all over me. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Now, where are you from? Name your city. Maybe this I'm little light of mine. I, oh, all I'm gonna, over Bath. Where are you from? I'm gonna let it shine all over Bevermore. I'm gonna let it shine all over Portland. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it 
other there is power in kindness right now I want you to just take a moment and say hello introduce yourself if you don't know them or even if you do to the person on either side of you and in yoga we say namaste but so that we see the heart and the light in each one of you so please take a moment now to greet your neighbor with love and kindness Great. Because that is what Maine is about. We are one of the kindest states in America. Not that you would know that necessarily now. But look at this. We are the antidote. We are the answer to what is Maine really like. This is what we are really like. This is your land. Okay, great. We will in one second. When we do this, I want everyone to just put their right hand up like this. And right hand, oh sorry, under the trees, I love you over there. Right hand up. And we put our right hand up. This symbolizes that we are fearless. That we are ready to do what is necessary. To take, take this on, to take this issue on. To help make sure that people all over the state and the country know that they matter. Every single one of us matters. At the same time, I want you to take your left hand and I want you to put it down and open by your side. That is the hand of compassion. We are fearless in standing up for what is right and loving people and we are compassionate about those who are hurting, those who need our love and assistance, and those who need our help, including the person who lives at the Blaine House. Feel the power, feel the strength, and feel the love. And now, there was a request, so I'm going to honor it, to sing This Land is Your Land, wherever you were from. So, okay. right, thank you. Okay, so we'll just do one verse of that, and then we'll do our closing. So, ready? This land is your land, this land is my land, from California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest 
to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me. Let's do it one more time. This land is your land. This land is my land. From main shores to main mountains. From the redwood forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me. So yay! Woo! All right. So I'd like to end with a couple of notes first about action. If you are here and you have not yet written a letter to your legislator, to the governor, to the newspapers, to say how you feel about what is happening in our state right now, please do it. If you know someone who is struggling with drug addiction, a family who is being touched, or is struggling from the burdens of racism, or homophobia, or violent threats, reach out your hand to them and be a good neighbor. Be a kind person. And tomorrow is the National Overdose Awareness Day. There's going to be a service in um, Monument Square in 530 in Portland. If you're able to be there, please be there. I am now going to share a poem by Catherine Fry. And I'd like you to listen to it. I'm going to try and read it slowly, which is not my forte. But this is how we are going to end tonight, as we then will turn and face the Blaine House and send energy and compassion and hopes for the right thing happening tonight. You've asked me to tell you of the great turning of how we saved the world from disaster. The answer is both simple and complex. We turned. For hundreds of years we had turned away as life on earth grew more precarious. We turned away from the homeless men on the streets, the stench from the river, the drug addicts, the children orphaned in Iraq, the mothers dying of AIDS in Africa. We turned away because that's what we had been taught. To turn away from our pain, from the hurt in another's eyes, from the drunken father, from the friend betrayed. Always we were told, in actions even louder than words, to turn away, turn away. And so we became a lonely people, caught up in a world moving too quickly, too mindlessly, towards its own demise. Until it seemed as if there was no safe place to turn, no place inside or out, that did not remind us of fear or terror, despair and loss, anger and grief. Yet on one of those days, like today, someone did turn. Turn to face the pain, turn to face the stranger, turn to look at the smoldering world and the hatred seething in too many eyes, turn to face himself, herself. And then another turned, and another, and another. And as they wept, they took each other's hands. Until whole groups of people were turning, young and old, gay and straight, sober and not, people of all colors, all nations, all religions, turning not only to face the pain and hurt, but to the beauty gratitude and love, turning to one another with forgiveness and a longing for peace in their hearts. At first, the turning made people dizzy, even silly. There were people standing to the side, gawking, criticizing, trying to knock the turners down. But the people turning kept on turning and help kept, they kept getting up, kept helping one another to their feet. Their laughter and kindness brought others into the turning circle.
sorry. Um, turned to face them, sorry. And as they wept, they took each other's hands. Oh, I don't feel that way, sorry. Uh, oh, at first the turning made people dizzy, even silly. Turn of people standing at the side, gawking, criticizing, trying to knock the turners down. But the people kept turning and kept helping another one another to their feet. Their laughter and kindness brought the others into the turning circle until even the naysayers began to smile and sway. And as the people turned, they began to spin, reweaving the web of life, mending the shocking tears, knitting it back together with the colors of the earth, sewing on tiny mirrors so that the beauty of each person, each creature, each plant, each life might be seen and respected. And as the people turned, they spun like the earth through the universe, the web wrapped around them like a soft baby blanket, making it clear that all were loved and nothing separate. As this love reached into every crack and crevice, the people began to wake and wonder, to breathe and give thanks, to celebrate together. And so the world was saved, and the state of Maine was saved, but only as long as you too, sweet one, remember to turn. I ask now that each of us turn in this direction. So that our love for our state and for every single person in this state who matters, who has a heart, who has a voice, who has a story, knows that we care and that we love. We ask just now that the people in leadership, our leaders, our governor, our legislators, come together to do the right thing, to save Maine from disaster, to save Maine from a culture of hurt and hatred, to turn it back to love, which is who we really are. I thank every single one of you from the bottom of my heart and for the hundreds of people who wanted to be here tonight but could not be here because we, all of us, are Turners, and all of us are going to save the state of Maine to once again make it the best place in the world to live. Thank you, thank you, thank you. On your way out, let's be kind, let's be civil, let's take action, and let's all do the right thing, from loving our neighbors to taking political action to being active in November, all of those things that we need to do to make this ship right again. Thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for joining us. Yay. Good night.